Okay, so here's how you can start your mains with two flying clamps, only two flying clamps. If you don't have a starting clamp, if you do have a starting clamp, it'll be a little, it'll be a lot easier. But I'll show you how to do this without a starting clamp. So we'll pretend you don't have a starting clamp. We won't even be using a starting pin for those of you who have clipper mates. So no starting pin, no starting clamp, no offset clamps clamping far away from the frame and I'm going to try to work through this whole procedure I'll have to do it twice because there's scenario A and scenario B depending on whether or not your frame has mains that start at the throat or mains that start at the head in other words if you have six holes in the throat or eight holes in the throat the procedure will be slightly different and I'll run through both scenarios this frame has six holes in the throat, so the main start at the throat, and we'll work through situation scenario A, then scenario B, and then also I will show you with a racket that has eight holes in the throat, in other words, mains that start at the head. But first, let's clarify what scenario A and B are, uh, the differences are. So I'm going to try to do this with the bright green string. This is just a scrap piece of string that I had laying around. Hopefully it holds up to doing all the uh, the examples. If it should break, I will have to switch over to uh, another scrap piece of string I've got laying around, but it's clear. It'd be a lot harder to see on camera, but I at least wanted to cover what, we're, what scenario A and scenario B are with the green string where you can see it really well. So these are not great flying clamps, but um, if you have a clipper mate, certain machines will have two flying clamps that are identical to one another. Some machines will have clamps where they're slightly different. Um, in case you can't pick up on it, uh, the width of these are different. One is a little bit narrower for strings that are closer together, sort of like these. That's just about the right spacing. This clamp is a little bit wider. And um, the reason you would choose the narrower one versus the wide one is about your spacing on your strings, largely when you're doing the crosses. So this fits. Also, this one has five teeth, and or five separators, and then this has only four. So this is for wider spacing. So if you had a more open pattern racket where you didn't want to deflect the mains as much, you would use this one with the four teeth and the wider gap. And this one is a little bit tighter with the five. So you can think of this maybe being for like an 1820, and maybe this is for like a 1618 or a 1619. Just really depends on how far the holes are drilled apart more than anything. And when you're doing the crosses, since you only really need to use one flying clamp that you can keep moving back and forth, you can select the one that's more appropriate. Obviously, during the, doing the mains, you have to use them both. But nonetheless, um, so scenario A is check your racket using your particular clamps and see if you can clamp two strings together. Obviously, you can. Now, here's where... Scenario A and Scenario B will differ. With your other clamp, are you able to put it on the next two strings immediately beside this clamp? In other words, this clamp and this clamp are side by side and not interfering with each other and there is not a string between the two of them at all. They are clamping neighboring strings. I'm going to zoom in so that you can see that a little better. So hopefully now you can see a little bit better. We've got these two strings clamped with this flying clamp and the next two strings are clamped with this flying clamp so they're immediately next to one another and they can fit there without interfering with each other or without pushing on one another greatly like that. So this is scenario A in that you're able to put your clamps immediately next to one another like this. Scenario B is if your clamps are wider than this or more obtrusive for whatever reason and you find that you cannot achieve this position with them side by side. If you find that you have to have this clamp one string further over, in other words, the closest you can find in other words, the closest that you can find that you can get these clamps to one another is that there must be a string in between them. That's what we're going to call scenario B. So scenario A, the clamps can be immediately next to one another. And scenario B is there. you must have 
a spacer string. We'll call this a spacer string, but in other words, if that's the closest you can get them. So now that we've established scenario A and B, let's work through them from the beginning. Okay, so scenario A, where your two clamps are able to be on neighboring strings immediately next to one another. Fill in the center two mains with the equal amount on both sides, just like you would for any normal two-piece string job. So this isn't 20 feet of string, but if it was, we've got 10 feet here and 10 feet here, and this is the central loop because this racket starts at the throat. So feed those two strings through, and this is where if you had a starting clamp, you would place the starting clamp on one of these two strings here at the head of the racket so that you could pull the other one. But you don't have a starting clamp or we're pretending that you don't. You're going to use one of your flying clamps as a starting clamp on the outside of the frame. Now, my racket with this mount, it overhangs the frame a little bit. In other words, a uh, a regular starting clamp I can actually get on that string if I want to at the head of the racket without having to use a spacer. I normally use a spacer um, anyway, but with this being so clunky and big, it's not going to fit in there really well. So I'm going to use a little um, flat clothespin that I've sawed off. I use this all the time when I start my mains. So it's, I've got a slot there and I place this over the two strings and then I clamp there. So this solves the problem of this uh, recess or this overhang here from the mount. So if you're using a clipper mate or a, a lot of two point uh, drop weight type machines, you might have the same problem. Even though um, I'm not using a drop weight here, I still have this uh, issue to contend with sometimes. So I'm going to use this. And what we're going to do is since flying clamps are designed to clamp two strings simultaneously to get their holding power, you can't really just clamp them onto one string individually like you would a regular starting clamp. What we're going to do is we're going to clamp one string here up against the frame in a minute, but you want to go ahead and find the other end of this string and take the tail of the same side that you're about to clamp and you're going to put it in the other half of the clamp like so so that it acts as a spacer. It takes up the, the room there so that you get the full clamping power on the string. So that's how you want to set it up, is you're going to clamp the string that you intend to, to hold, the tail, and then if your machine is like mine, you'll want to put this little, your, your starting block uh, or some kind of spacer. This, this is my, my solution to buying a, a starting block an overpriced starting block. Another thing you could use real quick is if your over grips come uh, individually wrapped like the roll, not where they're kind of flat but on the little um, like a little spool on the in the inside of the over grip is a little plastic barrel, a little nylon barrel like this. If you hang on to one of those you could use that. You could feed that over the string and put that against the frame and that can be your little starting block or your spacer. But I, I use this because with the slot I can simply pull it off. I don't have to thread it onto the string and thread it off of the string. But you could use something like this. Anything that will create enough space to where you can put your starting clamp or in this case the flying clamp up against the frame and it doesn't interfere with your mounting system. So this is, this is the trickiest part of the whole endeavor, is how to get this starting clamp and this uh, clothespin in my case, or your starting block, on there. Before that falls off, I have to feed the string in on one side, bring the tail over, and put the tail on the other side of the flying clamp. And finally, should have locked my turntable. All right, so everything's in place. That's the trickiest part, so don't be scared off by this yet. So let me unlock the turntable. So now what we're going to do is 
we're going to pull the opposite side. So in, in this particular case, I've clamped the string nearest me here with the flying clamp. And this is the string we're going to tension first. So we're going to tension this. All right, take two. I tried to run through it with the bright green string, but it's just too slippery and too skinny for these uh, flying clamps, which are not adjustable to hold. It just kept sliding through. So we're going to go through this again using the clear string. It'll be harder to see, but I'll, hopefully I'll explain it well enough that you can follow along. So I'm going to put my little piece of wood here, my makeshift starting block. I'm going to put the string in one side of the flying clamp and the tail of the same string on the opposite side of the flying clamp and clamp those two together. So now that's going to press against the frame and we're going to pull tension on the opposite side. So now go ahead and tension the opposite main. So this is the string that we just tensioned. So this has now got full reference tension. This one will have something less than that because of the friction and going around. But we're going to be retensioning this string later when we remove our starting clamp, or in this case our flying clamp, which is acting as a starting clamp on the outside of the frame. So this is at full reference tension over here. So again, we won't be clamping in the center. We won't be clamping offset or staggered when the clamps are near one another. This will give you perfect reference tension on each and every single pull. So start out by tensioning that string and clamping these two mains together with your other flying clamp. Release tension. The same string you just tensioned, which is this one, thread that and tension another main on the same side of the racket. So we're working with the left side of the racket from your perspective. So I'm tensioning main number two on the left. And move the start move the flying clamp from this end to here and release tension. So right now I'll take this out for clarity. I'm so used to weaving ahead. So we've got some tension on this right main, which we'll take care of in a minute. Full reference tension on this left main and the second left main. So this is for scenario A, where you are able to have two clamps side by side without a string running in between them. If that's the case, if your clamps will allow that, Now's the time to get this flying clamp off the outside of the frame. So find the string that's coming out, not the tail, but the, uh, the regular strand, and tension that and remove that flying clamp and starting block if you were using one. And then we're going to, so this now puts full reference tension on the first left, I'm sorry, the first main on the right side of the racket. You're going to clamp these two together right up against the frame or as close as you can get and release tension. Now you're going to thread and tension the second main on the right side of the racket. And once we tension that, we'll be clamping these two strings together. This is the scenario where these two clamps are able to sit side by side. And move this clamp that's away from your tension head and put it on these two strings like so. And release tension. And now you're off to the races. You can continue the next main. Right now at this point we have two mains tensioned on the left, two mains tensioned on the right. If your clamps will allow for this configuration where they're side by side and don't interfere with each other, I would suggest you go this route because you're not stringing three mains on one side. You're not getting that far ahead. I know that the USRSA 
says it's okay to string three mains on one side, six mains on the other, or th always that you can be three ahead on any given side, but I strive to not do that. I only like to be one ahead or two ahead on a given side and then go back and forth rather than getting th up to three ahead. So I think this method is preferred because you're not doing three on one side of the racket before you start tackling any on the other. Um, and doing it this way, if your clamps will allow for this, you achieve that. You only have two strings on the left and two strings on the right, and now you can string one or two and continue as per normal. But you'll notice that the clamps were never interfering with each other and never had to be staggered or offset at all. But I realize that some of you have flying clamps that will not allow for this situation, this scenario. So this was scenario A. So let's go back to the beginning for scenario B, where your clamps need to have for them to be side by side or close to side by side, you find that you need a strand to be in between the two. This is how you do that. So just like before, thread the two center mains with an even amount on both sides. So if this was 20 feet of string, it'd be 10 feet and 10 feet just like we did a moment ago. You're gonna do the exact same thing. So you put the flying clamp on one strand here. And put the tail of the same string on the opposite side of the clamp. So that'll stay there. That's the trickiest part of the whole procedure, is just getting that set up. This is exactly what makes it so much easier if you just have a starting clamp that you can throw on there. All right, so now we're gonna tension the opposite main. So just like before, this side will have a little less than reference tension, but the left first main has full reference tension right now. Clamp these two together as close to the frame as you can. Release tension. Thread and tension the next main on the same side, which is in my case the left side here. Once that's tensioned, move this flying clamp to the opposite end. Again, as close to the frame as possible. Now this is where on scenario A, we went and tensioned the other string, the first main on the right side of the racket. Because right now, we have two mains at full reference tension on the left, and only the single main on the right side at something a little less than reference tension. And that's where we would go and free up this flying clamp. But this is now we're working through scenario B where you need that single strand between the two clamps. So in this case, you go ahead and take the strand on the left and you thread and tension now a third main on the same side of the racket. So in other words, we're now doing a third main. So we're not violating any rules because as I said before, the USRSA allows you to do up to three strings on one side before needing to switch over. But move this clamp from the two strings it's on to the st two strings next door rather than moving it all the way down here. We're going to move it down here again in a minute. But what this does is it gives us the spacing down here that we need. Now you can tension the strand over here that's coming out of your flying clamp on the outside of the frame. Remove that flying clamp and your starting block if you're using one. Thread and tension. So this, this pull right here at this moment is applying the full reference tension on that first main on the right hand side. Previously it was tensioned to almost reference tension but now it has full reference tension on it without a clamp on it. So every string is getting full reference tension. So now we're threading the second main on the right half of the racket. Clamp off here. 
Now we're going to tension the second main, the one we just threaded. And now you can see when we move this clamp down here that there's a strand that's in between the two clamps. We have more space here. So if your clamps interfere and you can release tension. If your clamps interfere with each other, so this is scenario B where you needed the additional space here. So that's the workaround for this scenario. So now you're off to the races and you can resume. At this point you've got um, two strands, two left mains at full reference tension and two right mains and you can go ahead and now tension either, either side to get your third main in on the left and then your third main on the right and like I said now you're off to the races you shouldn't have any issues from here just keep going so now I'll show you this was a racket with six holes at, uh, at the throat. In other words, mains that started at the throat. Uh, we're going to do a racket. I'm going to switch rackets in just a second and put a racket that's got eight holes in the throat here to show you how to handle that type of racket. It's a little different because you still want to be able to put your starting clamp or the way we did here, the flying clamp on the outside of the frame. You still want to be able to put it at the head of the racket, especially if you've got big clunky flying clamps like this. Those are going to be a lot harder for you to try to somehow put down here inside the throat because everything will be opposite since our mains will be starting at the opposite end. If you do everything the way I just showed you, you would be needing to put your starting clamp inside the throat here. And you can be, maybe you've got a very small throat here depending on the frame. Even if you've got a starting clamp, it can be tricky depending on the mounting of your machine. So. A lot of times it's just tricky to do this, so I'm going to show you a way to do a racket with eight holes in the throat, yet you'll still be using your starting clamp or your flying clamp on the outside of the frame at the head of the racket where you've got more room, a little more comfort, and you can put your starting block in there and things won't be so cramped. So let me switch the frames and we'll be back. Okay, so we're back now with a frame that has eight holes in the throat mounted to show you how to work through the procedure with this type of racket. Now normally if you try to do this racket the way the same way we did the other one, this racket if you were to take your mains and stick them through the each of the central mains here on the top of the racket and thread them through this way you see how your central loop would be here instead of your central loop being in the throat and being able to clamp your starting clamp or your flying clamp at the top of the frame. If you do it this way, your central loop is going to be at the top of the frame and you'd somehow be trying to figure out how to fit a starting clamp in here, fighting possibly your mounting. Even if you had a legit starting clamp, it still might be tricky to get it on there, at least in a straight manner. And it's certainly going to be even harder if you're dealing with bulky or awkward shaped uh, flying clamps. So here's the workaround. We're not going to put a central loop at the top. We're not going to start the mains. We're not going to feed the mains through the same way you typically would by having the ends even and going from the tip down. So here's the altered way to do the mains that will still allow us to put the clamp on the outside of the frame at the top of the racket. So take the two strands, and what you're going to do is you're going to put both of these tips through the grommets from the throat, but not the two center ones. Pick one side or the other, so in this case, there's eight holes here. I'm going to insert these two ends through the first and the second on the right side of the racket from your perspective. You could do the left or the right, but I'm just arbitrarily going to do it on the right side of the racket. So by putting these two strands through here, 
we're going to bring the central one through grommet number one up through grommet number one at the top of the racket. And here's what you're going to do. Go ahead and take the second main, which is again still second main on the right side of the racket, and thread that through. But we don't want them even because we're offset. We're not in the center of the racket. So take the strand that's going through the first grommet on the right side of the racket, the central one. Take that one, pull a little bit out, and hold it and measure off one hoop's length. So you need this length to be accounted for the offset. So measure that off and just go a little bit outside the frame to a little bit outside the frame. And that length and keep your finger here. Then take the other strand and hold it there. So basically, we're going to ignore this additional extra length. And if you pretend that this was the two ends of the strands here, just hold those together and advance and pull the string through your hands the way you would when you do have these strands uh, equal length. If you're used to one piece stringing, this is essentially you're not going to have a short strand and a long strand. And so once you pull all the string through, we now have this loop not in the center. It's not a central loop, it's a slightly offset loop, but it, we still have the loop here in the throat nonetheless. And if you were to follow these two strands all the way to the end, keeping them together, you will find that basically you'll have a short piece which ends here. I know it's clear string and hard to see, but I've got a short strand ending just here past my thumb and then a longer strand here. And the difference between these two lengths is exactly what we pulled off a minute ago. The length of the hoop from tip to uh, from the outside of the bridge to the outside of the head. It's a hard way to hard thing to verbalize, but basically this offsets it so that ultimately the center of this piece of string 20 feet or whatever you've got, will be here at the top of the dead center at 12 o'clock, just as if you had threaded them through this way. It's just because we're offsetting. So now it's very similar to, if you haven't already watched the beginning portion of this where I had the other racket with the six holes here, you need to watch that first so that you understand what I'm doing now. Because from, from at this point, it's essentially the same procedure, but on the other racket, we weren't offset like this. So now we're going to take our starting clamp and our starting block, if you're using a starting block, and the strand closest to me, or in this case, the second main. I want to find the end of that because that has to go in our uh, flying clamp just like we did before. So place your little starting block in place if you're using that. Put this strand in one side of your floating clamp or flying clamp, whatever, and the other and the tip into the other side, just like we did before. So again, it's important that you watch that other portion if you haven't already. So that's set. Now we can pull the opposite side. So this is the strand. Main number two is the one clamped here on the outside of the frame. So strand number one, the central main, is the one that we can now tension, and we will do so. So now, like, be, like on the other racket, this side has less than reference tension, but we will take care of that in a moment when we come and retension this strand to remove this. This strand has full reference tension on it. It's the center strand, or, or main number one on the right half of the racket. So take your other flying clamp, clamp them together, release tension, and thread the next Using that same string that you just tensioned, we're now going to thread down from the tip of the racket the first main on the left side of the racket. Tension that string. Now move the flying clamp to these two strands here. 
So right now at this moment we have full reference tension on the two center strings. The first main on the left and the first main on the right and then something less than reference tension on this string but again we will take care of that momentarily. So keep stringing with the strand that you're working with. So we're now installing the second main string on the left. Once that's tensioned, move your clamp to these two strands here, release tension. Now remember when I talked about scenario A, where your two floating clamps or flying clamps can be very close to one another without a strand of string between them? If you're doing scenario A, if your clamps will allow for that, at this point you can tension this strand that's coming out of the flying clamp on the outside of the frame and once you tension that you'd move this to these two strands right here but you'd have to your, your clamps would have to allow for that so for scenario A you would do this now and then you would have this clamp and this clamp very close to one another if as I discussed on the other frame your clamps are too bulky to allow for that and you must have that buffer string, that, that string in between the clamps in regards to spacing, then do not tension this side yet. Go ahead and do one more string on the left side. In other words, continue with the same strand that we've been working with all along. Because right now at this moment, there's only two on the right and two on the left. So there's no harm and doing one more here on the left hand side. So it might be best to just hold off and not do this regardless, even if your clamps could fit that closely together. Since right now there's two on the left and two on the right, it's probably not a bad idea to just go ahead and tension the, uh, the now the third strand on the left half. And after that's tension, you can move this clamp down release tension. Now we can go and tension the correct strand coming out of the flying clamp here on the outside of the frame to get, get rid of that. Take your starting block out if you're using one. Remove this clamp. Thread and tension now what is the third, what will, I'm sorry, what will be the third uh, cross on the uh, third main on the right. But meanwhile, we have, to we have to clamp main one and main two together so that we can release the tension head. So now we pull the slack through. And now you can see, now is the, the time that these two clamps will need to be at the same end, so somewhat side by side, and you've got the space now that you need when you move this down here you've actually got plenty of space. There's actually two strands between these two. But during, and you can release your tension now. So during the course of all of these examples, scenario A, scenario B, regardless of whether you've got six holes in the throat or eight holes in the throat, you can do it without having these staggered or offset or um, away from the frame at any given point. And every time we're tensioning a string with full reference tension, it does not have a clamp on it. So it's a very clean, unobtrusive way to go about it. So hopefully that helps out. I think that covers all the scenarios, whether you've got six holes or eight holes, and whether your clamps will allow for them to be very close together, or if they need a little bit of a space, a buffer string or two in between. So I think that covers everything that we were talking about. Good luck.